Good morning, and I'd like to introduce to you Kevin Pate, the president of o Heritage Ohio. Joe, oh, thank you. Good morning. I am delighted to welcome everyone to Heritage Ohio's first virtual annual revitalization and preservation conference. Um, we know that virtual meetings have their challenges, right? Um, kind of extraordinary set of, of circumstances this morning, but um, hats off to the super capable staff at Heritage Ohio for quickly adapting and, uh, and overcoming this challenge. Um, but, you know, there are also some really cool advantages and opportunities to the virtual format, like enabling us to broaden our conference audience, create a more dynamic platform, share input from more diverse perspectives and experiences. And this morning we'll get an example of that in our first session, Branding Your Organization. Um, I'd like to remind everyone as we kick off the conference that when you're not in a session or you're between sessions, mosey on over to our resource room. Uh, we have dozens of extra content sessions, presentations, Main Street 101 sessions, interviews, tours, and, and so on. And at the end of the day, join us for a happy hour. We'll have um, more relaxed sessions that will give you the opportunity to interact and network through various themes. You know, this conference is made possible by the generous sponsors uh, and our ability to offer top-notch opportunities for learning, networking, and celebrating wouldn't be possible without the generosity of our sponsors. So please join me in thanking Sandvik Architects, conference title sponsor and sponsor of this morning's inaugural session. Jonathan Sandvik founded Sandvik Architects in 1990 and ever since has firmly established uh, his company's commitment to assisting with revitalization of downtowns and urban neighborhoods. Um, they have been the recipients of dozens of, of awards for excellence and are committed to um, preservation planning with uh, community vitality and viability at its heart. And with that, I would like to introduce my friend and colleague and true preservation hero, Jonathan Sandvik. Thank you so much, Kevin. I deeply appreciate that. Kevin has done a fantastic job uh, as chair of the Heritage Ohio organization, uh, leading a terrific uh, team of board members uh, who have done a terrific job, but Kevin's leadership is greatly appreciated. Further, I'd like to also uh, thank uh, the team for Heritage Ohio, uh, led by Joyce Barrett, who has just done a terrific job uh, in the leadership over uh, these many years, with the great support of Francis Joe Hamilton, uh, with Miles Devon, and of course with Frank Quinn. So terrific uh, team members who have given terrific leadership. And of course, we are also thankful to uh, the State Historic Preservation Office and Economic Office, uh, as well as the National Park Service and many others who have helped. But I would most like to thank our Main Street um, members, our Main Street managers and our Main Street board members who are my heroes. Uh, candidly, I am grateful to have the opportunity to support you in this uh, sponsorship, and I'm grateful to have the capacity to do it, but because you've done such fantastic work, I am deeply grateful for that and want to support it. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, who is a terrific um, a speaker. Uh, his name is Ben Malthroth. Um, he is a partner with Arnett uh, Malthro, and he is a talented graphic designer who has been designing for over 25 years with experience in a wide variety of marketing applications. He provides community identity and branding services for communities across the United States. And of particular interest, Ben has worked 
on many projects specializing in the development of city and neighborhood identities, wayfinding strategies, and promotional marketing materials. And with that, please welcome Ben Malthro. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan. And, and again, I'd like to echo uh, Kevin's both introduction and, and thanks for uh, Sandbrook Architects uh, sponsorship this morning. Um, you, you've got some some real guts to sponsor me because I've been accused to not have a filter. I'm going to do my best uh, this morning. I am thrilled to be kind of the kickoff speaker this morning for Heritage Ohio's virtual conference. Um, I, too, am a huge, huge supporter of the Main Street movement. And I am excited to uh, jump right in this morning and share a little bit with you. Uh, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about both branding your place and your organization and how those two interact with one another. Um, if you will see a little bit of housekeeping, first of all, we are recording this. So if you do have any um, thing that you want to go back and kind of dig into, that video recording will be available. I am going to be more than happy to share the PDF of the presentation with you all. So we'll make sure that that is easy for you to get your hands on to go back and reference as well. And please feel free. Um, I'm not exactly sure which format um, is showing up best on your end, but we have both the questions area and the chat function and I'm able to see both of those so please feel free to jump in during the presentation ask any questions that you might have and I will be more than happy to hit those uh, and then we will also have an opportunity at the end to do some Q&A but I'd love to jump right in and again thank you again for joining us and uh, thrilled to kick off the the virtual conference this year so I think we heard a little of that introduction. My name is Ben Muldrow. I'm with a, a company called Arnett Muldrow and Associates. We're based down in Greenville, South Carolina. I live in Milford, Delaware. But one of the, the things that I love to kind of tell folks is we have worked for over 20 years with communities that are trying to revitalize their downtowns. And one of the, the first things that we realized was every time we would go into a community, we would review their past plans. And they had these beautiful plans with these fantastic recommendations that gone that had gone unimplemented. So we started to ask that question, why do these great suggestions go unimplemented? And we came to realize that if a vision didn't truly become embraced by the community, if the citizens didn't fall in love with that vision, then the realization of that vision could never make it through the turnover and elected leadership. So we started to create brand systems as part of that downtown revitalization plan that had never really been done before. In fact, when I first started doing this, there nobody was using the term community branding. We, we called it community identity workshops and, and we integrated that messaging into the plan itself. And one of the great things we've seen is we have seen implementation continue to improve. So I think it's fair to say, um, or it's fair to start with this simple question, why do we brand? Uh, believe it or not, we don't brand simply so consultants can charge a whole lot of money to, to do branding systems. Um, it, it's actually a, a pretty simple reason why this is a focus that we have that maybe we didn't have 30 years ago. And the way I always like to illustrate it is I have five kids, so it feels like we are constantly celebrating someone's birthday. So how would we have celebrated the third, our, a child's birthday? Well, in the 1940s, you would have gone to your local grocer, you would have bought flour, eggs, and sugar, and you would have spent about 50 cents and gone home and made a cake. And I did double check, a, a five pound bag of uh, flour in the 1940s averaged 22 cents. So um, you really, you know, you can kind of see this, this kind of focus in on a very, very minimal um, investment. Now by the 60s, we probably would have gone to that same local grocer, but now we'd be spending about $2 and we'd buy a cake mix, which had recently been introduced. By the 80s, we're going to a chain grocery store and we're buying a quarter sheet cake for about 10 or $12. If you're a child of 80s like I am, you'll remember those kind of creepy plastic crown he uh, clown heads that were on these. Um, they are the stuff of nightmares. 
Uh, but now we fast forward to 2020 and we're spending $500 and we're renting Fortnite trailers. Um, what this really shows us is it shows us this evolution from a raw material economy into a product economy, a service economy, and now we are in the heart and soul of the experience economy. And as long as consumers are making decisions based off the experiences that are afforded to them, then branding will always be important. So always like to share my definition, branding is the discovery and preservation of a community's personality. A community does not get branded. Um, that personality very much exists. Now, you can go through a process that either embraces and preserves that personality or ignores that personality altogether. But when you go through a process in a community, we truly believe that your goal is to identify those values and characteristics that your community cherishes and then ingrain them in everything that you say or do so that you are preserving that character while opening the door for economic prosperity. Now, with that, this overall goal of what we're shooting for is to create something that we call brand equity. And to illustrate the idea of brand equity, I always share this next image. And I ask the audience, and it's a little bit harder uh, in a virtual format, as you can imagine, but, you know, I show this, uh, this Mercedes sports utility vehicle, and I ask folks, how much do you think that this is worth? Strangely enough, almost universally, the first answer that I will get is $60,000. They don't know anything about what features it has. They don't know anything about what the, the extra amenities or accessories have been added onto it. They see the car, they see the brand, and they automatically put a value of $60,000. And then I forward to the next slide and reveal that this car is actually a Kia and ask if the car is still worth $60,000. Nothing about what you see is different, nothing about actual situation is different, but the overall perceived value drops in half. Typically, I hear people say thirty to $35,000. Now, all that said, when you think about a community, your community has value. And as you attempt to grow your community, create a more vibrant downtown district, or, or even preserve those unique buildings and that fabric that makes your place yours, you're asking people to take a little more risk, invest a little more dollars, maybe stay open a little later, maybe drive a little farther, maybe spend a little more. And the identification and then being able to utilize that brand equity is key for your community. And it's also key for your organizations to understand that even though you might have many different groups, your organizational goals are to collectively build brand equity for your place. So I've learned long ago that to truly be an expert, you have to have a series of rules. So I decided to come up with the five rules of what not to do uh, with branding. Uh, the number one rule is what I call the khaki rule. Imagine if every single one of us at this conference were sitting down in the same room, socially distanced, of course, and we were forced to come up with one and only one outfit that we would wear for the rest of our lives. Now, there's absolutely no doubt that we would end up in khaki pants. Chances are we would probably end up with some sort of solid color shirt and possibly a polo shirt. Without knowing it, we might even end up looking like we worked at Best Buy. That's because the goal of that process was consensus. What is the barest minimum that everyone can live with? The barest minimum is not what you want to do when representing your organization or when representing your place. Uh, I've got a great example to share with you. This is a, a county, Kittitas County, Washington. It is just east of Snoqualmie Pass. 
Um, Snoqualmie Pass, if you're not familiar with the state of Washington, this is the kind of geographic feature that separates the gray and rain of Seattle from the full color and the beautiful outdoors of the rest of the state of Washington. So we created this very simple message, live life in color, inviting folks to escape the urban market and come out to Kittitas County and take advantage of the color that they can't necessarily see points farther west. Well, then the committee got a hold of it. And of course, anytime you're working with a county, if you've ever dealt with uh, county organizations, you know there's tremendous diplomacy that must happen. So the, or, the committee said, well, nobody knows where we are, so maybe our logo should, should be the state so we can highlight where we are. And then don't forget, we're, we're a county, so we want to make sure to name every single community in our county so people's feelings don't get hurt. And you know, Washington color, that's that's bold and all, but we, we need people to know where we are. So maybe central Washington color. And then the committee went forward and, and went even more. You know, they were like, well, we really want to make sure that every single community feels equal. Well, what better way to, to show equality than let's put everybody's name in a circle. And finally, once they got to this point, Somebody from the committee said, I'm not sure if you realized it or not, but we have literally moved as far away from anything that looks good as possible. And luckily the committee went back. But the thing that you always have to remember is it is extremely important to listen to many opinions. It is extremely important to identify and discover and engage with your community. But that needs to happen on the front end of the process. It needs to happen before you have concept, before you have strategy. And you listen and engage the community and, and find out those characters and values that they cherish. You then create the system that helps to preserve those qualities and characteristics. And when you present that system back to the community, you present it with the goal of inspiring them. If you can listen and then turn around and inspire, then you have a community that is excited and believes in itself. And if your organization becomes that point of inspiration, you help to further solidify your role as that linchpin in both revitalization, economic development, economic growth, sustainability. If you are the one who creates inspiration, you are the one who is allowing great things to happen. That leads us to rule number two, the contest rule. Um, you know, I always try to, to ask folks, think about the last time that you saw a State Department of Transportation go out and do a design contest for an interstate bridge. You can't remember? It's because that's too important. It's just too important a task to leave it up to a design contest. And to be honest, our organizational logos and our community identities are just too important. Um, I've got some, some great examples to share of what happens when you do decide to use design contests to try to, to tell your organization or your group or your community's story. Uh, the first is from a community in India. Um, I, I hope that some of you are actually a little speechless. This is, uh, this is truly, well, it's thorough. It gets points for thoroughness. Um, one of the interesting things when you take everything that's in this, everything from a forklift to um, a wind turbine to a Soviet era rocket ship, um, it, you have to realize that this community obviously is proud of a multitude of things, but could not figure out a way to tell that or share that in a succinct way. Uh, in fact, if you really look at this, the thing that is interesting to me is the community's name, Kakanada, is actually the smallest component of the whole composition. 
So you always want to be warned, especially from an organizational standpoint, um, your organizational identity does not have to explain every facet of what you do. It does not have to be a, a map painting the way to the, to the end. It, it just, it needs to be that basket that can hold together the understanding excitement of what you're creating. So on this path, I always like to share some other examples of some, some things where communities have obviously tried to be clever. So we'll jump over to the friendly state of Kansas, uh, La Crosse, Kansas, the barbed wire capital of the world. You can imagine that that works well for their economic development efforts. Um, but not to be undone by La Crosse, we cro go over to Gas, Kansas. Don't pass gas, stop and enjoy it. That's literally a fart joke. Um, you know, it's one thing to be funny. It's another thing to be silly. Um, and I think we can all imagine that that's not necessarily what we're going for. But I, I wish that this was the, the worst that I have to share with you, but it gets even better. Uh, Hooker, Oklahoma, it's a location, not a vocation. Now, you could look at this and think, well, that has to be a joke until I show you that all of their local sports teams are called the Horny Toads, and their local senior center even sells shirts, once a hooker, always a hooker t-shirts for fundraisers. So, you know, I think that this is one of those things I once had somebody say, but that's memorable. Yeah, it's memorable, but do you want to be memorable because you're a punchline? Uh, always think about how you're trying to connect, how you're trying to communicate, and what kind of impact you're trying to leave behind. But literally the one that left me with my head shaking the most was this next one. Severance, Colorado, where the geese fly and the bulls cry. I had absolutely no clue what that meant. Um, I assumed, having been working in Wyoming, that Maybe it was a reference to the beef slaughter industry because I knew that they were in the middle of, of significant ranch lands. We'll come to find out what it actually meant was they're the home of Bruce's Bar, known for their Rocky Mountain oysters. And if you're not familiar with Rocky Mountain oysters, those are bull testicles. So literally this community decided to wrap their entire community identity around bull testicles. I always use this as an opportunity to point out there's a big difference between saying what no one else can say and saying what no one else wants to say. So always be mindful of that. Rule number three, the seal rule. Um, many of our communities have these seals. Many of you that you your organizations are, are stewards of. Uh, lack any graphic tool to actually market the place, but instead have to try to use a, a community seal. And uh, this seal that you see from Whitesboro, New York, believe it or not, is their actual seal. Um, the locals guarantee that this is a friendly match of Indian wrestling between a native and a white settler. Um, when someone recently brought up that maybe this particular image is not culturally sensitive, um, they did what most communities do and said, hey, well, let's take it to a vote. And the village decided overwhelmingly to keep it just like it was. So um, you have to be very, very mindful of what happens. Seals are important tools, but they're not the tools to market. And I'll share a couple examples with you. Um, we've got this one from uh, Salisbury, Maryland. And again, winning points for thoroughness. They figured out how to fit tomatoes, pumpkin, haystack, cucumbers, apples, strawberries, beans, sailboat, pine tree, college building, tree lined road, and building line street all in the same place. And uh, if you're familiar with Star Wars at all, um, this, the top right corner, of this seal, this what appears to be 11 story buildings that do not exist in Salisbury is affectionately known as the Death Star Trench. So I guess you do win extra points if you get a Star Wars reference out of your community seal. But one of the best examples of what can be so bad about a community seal is this next example from my home state of South Carolina. Now this is St. Stephen. 
Um, as you can see, there were obviously six people that got to sit around this table and each one got to come up with a word. So trust, honor, justice, agriculture, industry, recreation. Um, you know, you have to figure out a way to get a tractor on it. It's always better. Uh, you've got industry represented by those clip art Christmas trees. And look at how much fun recreation appears to be. But the thing that has always stuck with me about St. Stephen is their patriotism, a, a community so proud to be Americans that they figured out how to put just the head and legs of an American eagle on their seal. Uh, this is the perfect example of when you try to say everything, you oftentimes end up saying very little. Rule number four, the screwdriver rule. Now, this is where we start to dig into the dynamics about the relationship between a community's identity and the organization identities. Now, we have actually learned a lot in looking at our colleges and our universities. Universities typically have an academic brand and then they have an athletic brand. Now, those two will be connected oftentimes by color but then there will be a different look and feel. There might be different typefaces. Um, they don't want, say, a bad football season on the athletic side to affect admissions on the academic side. The athletic side also wants far more ability to adapt, grow, and change their brand based off of the consumer demands because they get so much revenue from that ability to sell merchandise. So how does that relate to our communities? Well, we need to have these organization brands, that's our city government, that's our main street organization, that's our chamber, that's our convention and visitors bureau, our economic development entities. But then we need to have this destination brand, the thing that is shared by those organizations. You have to remember that if your Main Street organization only has a logo that says Main Street, and then let's say you're in one of those communities where your Main Street is called, I don't know, Walnut Street, you're constantly left with this conversation of, well, is our name wrong? Do we need to change the name of our organization? I would actually argue that the solution is simpler. Your organization is Main Street because you are connected to a statewide and national and even global network utilizing this four-point approach for revitalization, but the destination that you are promoting is your downtown or this neighborhood commercial district. Or you, you get the example where the, the Main Street truly becomes that organizational infrastructure, but it is the destination brand that really creates the uniqueness between the places. And then the final rule, the heart of the gateway to the hub of it all, um, the simple message of owning your brand. One of the things that we often do as, as communities is we like to essentially give all of our control away to another thing. Um, Welcome to Harrington, the hub of Delaware. Well, what does that even mean? It's like, oh, okay, well, we're we're the place that you drive through when you're going from one place you like to the other place that you like. Um, the heart of England Forest. Well, does that simply mean you're in the geographic center? Um, and I love this. This was an example down in Georgia where they have uh, Folkestone which is a gateway to Okefenokee Swamp. And then right down the road, Fargo, Georgia, gateway to the Okefenokee. So this idea of giving away your identity and putting it on something else that you can't control, you, you wanna make sure that you can truly shape that experience. Now, when I talk about the branding toolbox, uh, I think a lot of times, Consultants like to make this seem very mystical, like there's some sort of magic and, and you can only do it if you have this secret decoder ring. Um, we take a very, very simple approach to this. In our branding toolbox, be it organization or community-wide, we feel like there are four components that really make up that toolbox. 
it is our color palette, it is our typeface selections, it is our consistent approach to our message, and then it's our graphics package. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share with you a, a series of case studies on projects that we've worked on. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the steps that we take step by step. And I'm going to try to demystify this process for you so that as you're thinking about your organizational identity, you're thinking about the district or area that you're the steward of, you can start to make some of these de decisions for yourself. Now, with this branding toolbox, I'd like to dig a little deeper into these four components. And I'm going to use an example from a neighborhood district in Baltimore, Maryland, and it's called Jonestown. Now, one of the first things that we did in Jonestown, Jonestown has very, very low name awareness. Most people did not really realize where it was or what it was. Um, it's a very interesting district. They have a multitude of museums there. The uh, Maryland African American Museum is there. There's a, um, a historic building called the Shot Tower, which at one point was the tallest building in all the Americas, uh, is located right there. And also the Betsy Ross, House, or the Star Spangled Banner House, as it's called. Um, this has always been a neighborhood of immigrants. So what we did is we looked at the four major areas of immigration, Germany, Russia, Lithuania, and then this pan-African wave that came in, and we decided to bring all of the colors directly out of those flags representing those, those countries. So we were able to justify exactly where our colors came from. So then from there, we started to look at the graphic. Now, again, if you remember, I said they're the home of the Star Spangled Banner House. Obviously, that is... Um, that's a pretty, pretty interesting background story. So what we did was we started with this kind of designed, simplified icon representing this Star Spangled Banner. Now, not, not this perfect and clean flag, but that tattered image that was the inspiration to Francis Scott Key. So then from there, we looked at the Maryland state flag, which is unbelievably important to folks throughout Maryland. You see these colors and you see these designs represented throughout the state. There's tremendous pride connected to the Maryland flag. And then you fast forward to even looking at the Baltimore city flag featuring that shock tower and featuring that yellow and, and black um, all tying into that icon. So now all of a sudden you start to see this very, very simple image. And all these components have meaning, whether we're tying it into Baltimore, Maryland, the Star Spangled Banner, patriotism. But then even these eight colored components all tie in to the eight landmarks that exist in this district. One of the beautiful things here, they're the home of Lloyd Street Synagogue. It's the third oldest synagogue in all of America, and it is the longest continually run running synagogue. Um, they're also the home of the longest running Jewish uh, deli in all of America that's been run by the same family. Um, so there's tremendous Jewish heritage in this neighborhood. And one of the interesting things was, although we didn't want to be too obvious, the negative space of this icon mirrors right up against the Star of David. So it was this really meaningful kind of built-in story to the simple icon. So then from there, with our typeface selection, we made some very simple, traditional typeface selections that brings the whole component together. So now you start to see how that story works and how a neighborhood whose colors were derived from the locations of its immigrants who played back to this pivotal role in, um, in the Star Spangled Banner. And we see this very, very simple phrase, this simple message, proudly we hail. What better way to talk about this immigrant 
culture, this voices from all over that come together to call a single place home. And it creates this very simple, what we call springboard for storytelling. Now with the message, we always like to show these kind of simple ways where you can take the that proudly we hail, we can tie it to the images. This is the top of the shot tower. I like to show this example because you can start to see where we took that edge of the top of the shot tower and it truly became a recurring graphic element along the bottom of our messaging. So yet another way to just tie elements and stories of the community together. The first casualties of the Civil War actually happened right there in Jonestown. Um, so being able to tell those stories that many people don't know, we talked about Atman's, the, the oldest Jewish deli continually run by the same family. The Lord Street Synagogue, third or oldest in the United States. Five museums, one neighborhood. So you can start to see this confident tone of feeling like this neighborhood had a story that was worth telling. So with that, I'm just going to jump through and I'm going to share with you a, a series of case uh, studies. This first one is one that I, I continue to love to this day. We, we did this probably 12, 15 years ago. Uh, this is the community of Opelousas, Louisiana. Now, Opelousas was very, very proud to be the third oldest community in Louisiana. And I always made fun of them. I was like, you know, there's a there's a pretty heavy market out there for visitors who are trying to visit the third oldest community in every state. But in actuality, when we started to dig in, we found some truly amazing stories. First of all, Opelousas is the home of Tony Satchery's. They're the largest producer of Cajun and Creole seasonings in the, the world. They're also the home of Savoy's. Savoy's makes uh, jarred roux. They produce more roux than anybody else around. And roux is a, a base ingredient in that Cajun Creole cultures. Uh, they're also the home of Zydeco music. They're instrumental in a, a variation of country music known as Prairie Country. I, I learned very much about the difference between a, a keyed accordion and a button accordion and what makes a fiddle a fiddle. Um, but they're also the home of a man named Clifton Chinois who invented the rub board and kind of formalized it as, a, as a, an instrument. So all of those things kind of went in together, this amazing connection to food, Cajun food, Creole food. And, and if you're not familiar, Cajun and Creole are not the same. Uh, Creole culture comes from French colonists, while Cajun culture comes from the Acadian, the French that settled in Canada and then left Canada and when they went back to France, they weren't allowed, they were outcast. So the Acadians then went and settled all throughout from, from New Orleans and, and Louisiana all the way south throughout South America. And these pockets of, of Acadian clusters and that, that Acadian is what grew to become Cajun. So when you hear Cajun and Creole, although they are both French cultures, there is a difference between those two. And learning and understanding those stories was extremely important in this region. So we wanted to tie all that together and we wanted to give them something that they could truly own. So the first thing that we did was we looked at their name. Now, Opelousas is an interesting name. It's not necessarily the kind of thing that you look at and just your mind automatically processes. So whenever you think about your name, be it organization name or community name, I always urge you to kind of look at it like this. The, the top is called title style. The next is called down style. Then we have small caps and all caps. Think about your name as graphics and make a decision based off the strategy of how you want to communicate. Now, I selected the top one, um, the title style. I liked how the descender of the lowercase p gave me an opportunity to nest a tagline under there. And then I also liked how the ascender of both the capital O and the, the lowercase l gave me a couple of spots to nest graphics. 
So with that, I then went and I started to look through different typefaces. I wanted to find a typeface that I felt like fit for the word. Now, here's a word of warning. Just because you're an organization with a focus on historic preservation does not mean that your typeface needs to be old or needs to be um, look antiquated. You don't have to use papyrus. I give you permission to use clean and contemporary typefaces. In this particular circumstance, we decided on a script typeface because we actually wanted a typeface that was a little harder to read. Now, here when I say that, that's an odd thing for someone to decide. We knew that Opelousas was an interesting name already, and if we put it in a script typeface, we could literally stop someone in their tracks because they see a name that they're not familiar with that's difficult to read. It makes them slow down and truly process. And that was something that we did intentionally. So when you bring all that together, this is what we landed on. Opelousas, perfectly seasoned. And that simple two word line, perfectly seasoned, allows us to talk about being this third oldest community in the state, this amazing heritage and history. It allows us to talk about being the birthplace of Zydeco music and this music that is so widely known and associated with the st state of Louisiana. And then of course that obvious tie-in to all of these amazing foods and flavors. So from there, we then wanted to look at graphically, how do we represent that? We wanted to give them an icon that helped to tell those stories. So we created this stylized version of the O. And in that, we nested both a fiddle and a keyboard accordion, which was appropriate for Zydeco. We put in a seasoning shaker, and then also this Florida de lis to tie in with that culture and that heritage. And we created three different storyline tracks, seasoned sounds, seasoned flavors, and seasoned culture, and it allowed them to tell that story. So then when you combine all that together, this is what that primary identity system looks like. And what is so very important in our communities, and for those of you, especially those Main Streeters out there, um, I am sure that you get as frustrated as I do with having to constantly explain, first of all, what is Main Street? And then second of all, why in the world we're doing this? Anytime we develop a brand system like this, we feel like it is important to launch with community pride. And in Opelousas, we launched with this campaign called It Is Great To Be Us. And simply highlighting that us in the middle of their name and reminding people why Opelousas is such a great community. We need to convert the locals into evangelists. We need to have them help become members of our chorus and help to tell our story. Now, one of the cool things this kind of built into this system is anytime we do a community brand or an organizational brand, we always do input meetings. We always ask questions about, you know, what it is you love about the community. And one of the things that we ask is, is if your community was a color, what color would it be? And and honestly, this is one of those questions where you ask it a lot and the overwhelming majority of the time, the, the answers that you get are not particularly helpful. Um, we get a lot of people that are like, well, you know, I feel like we're blue and green because we have trees and, and a sky, you know? And it's like, okay, well, I get it, but that's not, that's not really helping us out. In Opelousas, when we asked this question, people were unbelievably specific. They, one person actually said, well, we're not quite paprika. And I was like, oh my gosh, what in the world are they talking about? Well, come to find out. Later on in the day, somebody said, I'll tell you what we are. We're the color of Tony Satchery's seasoning. So I went to the grocery store. I bought a, a can of this seasoning. I went back to my hotel and poured it out on that plastic bathroom tray, and I took a picture of the Tony seasoning, and that's what you see before you. This picture of this color and this texture, something that is truly derived from both their culture, but also their economy. 
And that texture became the background for all of their billboards, the backboard, background for their brochures, the background for their advertising. So being able to tell those stories is extremely important as we talk about the things that our community has to offer. And as you can see with these examples, they had some amazing stories. They're the home of four different Grammy winners. So we kind of featured that. Um, right after we developed the branding system for them uh, was the, the year that the New Orleans Saints went on to win the Super Bowl. And they have a player for the Saints named Devery Henderson. Devery Henderson played high school at Opelousas High School and won the state championship and then went on to play football for LSU and won the national championship and then immediately left and went on to play for the Saints and won the Super Bowl. Literally, he won the top level championship in football in the same state at every single level. So as soon as that happened, we put together this ad for them to kind of highlight that. And then I also always like to talk a little bit about this, this photo. Um, this guy, his name is actually Joe Citizen. And Joe is the person who brought out the Zydeco community. Uh, it's one thing to tell people that you're the birthplace of Zydeco music. But if you can't hear that music, especially if you can't hear it live, then you're actually leaving people left let down. They, if That's a great story, but I want to hear it. I want to see it. I want to be a part of it. Joe has helped make sure that if you go to Opelousas, you can hear live Zydeco music six nights a week. So it's always really important to make sure that as you are promoting your stories, that you are identifying those experiences that people can actually take away from them. Don't forget, we're in that experience economy. If you sit there and say that you are a railroad town and a person can't see or climb on or ride a train, then they're not getting the experience that you say you have. So with that, we're gonna jump over to Elkins, West Virginia. And with this example, I'm gonna to try to break the process down a little bit and illustrate a little bit more some of the steps that we go through in our minds. Now with Elkins, the, the first thing that I always like to do is look at what you have. Do a simple Google search for your community. Pull out all the logos that you see. So we were working for Elkins Main Street. And you see at the top what Elkins Main Street's logo was at the time. But then as we started to look, we found the depot had a logo, the city had a logo, the chamber had a logo, historic landmarks had a logo, and then we even saw event logos and countywide CVB logos. So you have to consider all those, take them all into consideration. The goal is not to try to force every single organization to look alike. There is important difference between the organizations. But you do want to at least feel like you're from the same place and that you are promoting that brand equity in the same community. So step two, try to make sense of the colors. As you could see on the, the first slide, the, the colors are all over the map. So what we did is in looking at this, we tried to identify the logos that had the most thought put into them and had the most pre-existing brand equity. And we looked at the Davis and Elkins Senators, which is a local college, and then the city of Elkins. And what we actually did was we created a color palette that bridged from that city logo to that Davis and Elkins red and black. So literally every color that we have in this palette was pre-existing except for the orange. And simply by introducing the orange, we were able to create a consistent seven color color palette that ties in the entities with major brand equity. So then from there, create consistency in your name. This was really, really important for us to, to identify how using a signature typeface. And what we actually did was we selected a, a single typeface family. 
And this family had many, many different varieties. And that way it made it easy to kind of put some restraint up and just say, hey, you can pick anything out of this family. And this is what that word type looks like, this kind of simple um, beveled look in all caps. Now, there we had to embrace the awkward. There was this very interesting dynamic about Elkins, West Virginia, where anytime you would Google Elkins, I kept getting these really, really weird weather maps. And if you notice, it's like, okay, so in Virginia, it's negative four degrees in Quantico, but in Elkins, it's negative 28. And you can see this kind of stream through here where, you know, it is oftentimes 15 to 20 degrees colder in Elkins than it is in Washington, D.C. So every single time Washington, D.C. and sometimes even Baltimore and Philly will do their weather maps, they always tell people what the temperature is in Elkins, West Virginia. So it's this kind of interesting observation. So you have to sit there and I love this one. I mean, it's like everybody else is blue and then you've got this great big pink spot all around Elkins. So how do you package that idea all together? And what we came up with was this idea of unexpectedly cool. Take that idea that people know, hey, it's cold out there, it's cold out there, and create this cool, brand, this cool personality, this this idea of, okay, well, yes, we're in the mountains. Yes, we're a community that was based off of the timber industry, but you don't always have to show trees the same way. And what better way to embrace a community that known to be cool than truly lean into it? So with that destination brand, we created the stylized trees, we created the, the different uh, looks and feels, we did a couple different scales so that you had the right size um, at the right time. And that's really, really important. Uh, a brand is not about having one logo that you're forced to use all the time. It's about having the perfect wardrobe for you to be able to wear the right outfit for the right conversation. So again, you can kind of see the, the extension and the messaging, truly historic, unexpectedly cool, remarkably artistic, unexpectedly cool, naturally relaxing, unexpectedly cool. And then it really grows legs when you expand the system. So showing how that ties into the Main Street organization itself. So now they have this very simple compass rose represented from the four colors that tie in to the four point approach of Main Street. And then they have a modifier of the downtown tagline. If it's unexpectedly cool, then Main Street are the cultivators of cool. That's why you get involved. You like what's happening here? This is how you can be a part. So again, showing those different variations with the Main Street. And what we did there was we even created the colors and had them represent those four points, your design, your organization. A lot of communities have started calling organization outreach. You have your economic vitality or economic development. And then the promotion point, which I speak on often, you know, a lot of organizations, because they know that so much of the organization understanding kind of wraps around the events that they put on, some organizations have started to formalize that promotion group as more of the event arm. So there they called it Elkins Alive. And what it did was it actually made it far easier for the organization to not churn and burn committee members because it separated out the needs of event implementation volunteers from actual strategists and planners on our committee committees. So again, seeing how that system uh, grows and expands, simply tying the typeface in to the city logo and introducing this whole idea of America's forest capital 
Um, they did some of their numbers on their timber industry was absolutely amazing. So they've got this this strong tie to the um, to the Washington Jefferson National Forest. And this was the Chamber of Commerce logo. So again, showing very simple ways where just by adopting the typeface, they could start to move into the system without feeling like they'd given up their own logo. And then finally, the connecting the dots. This is where it starts to make its way into the, the event uh, logos themselves. These are kind of showing how uh, the forest festival can adopt the typefaces and some of the colors. We introduced First Fridays downtown, which has been wildly successful. Um, the Jazz Walk, Cash Mobs, Scarecrow Festival. So again, you start to see that the color palettes and the typeface, they don't actually limit you. They just create the appropriate boundaries to actually highlight creativity and creative design. We created a whole system around biking through the community and um, being able to promote biking into Elkins and through Elkins. And then we even created a new event called the Cabin Fever Brew Fest that was a way for them to bring vacation rentals in the region in to explore the craft beer that was happening there in downtown Elkins. So now you start to see there's tremendous consistency through their event schedule and they start to build brand equity by connecting the dots with all those positive experiences that, that um, happen when people participate in the events. We also like to look at things like the professional communications, designing a, a business card for the Main Street organization, having a historic design pattern book where we highlight best practices of preservation and, and reuse, adaptable reuse of our buildings downtown. Rolling the Heritage Quilt Trail, and uh, this is particularly connected to you guys. I had the privilege years and years ago to work directly with Donna Sue Groves down in, in Athens, Ohio, and, and develop the brand framework for the, the Quilt Barn program. And um, being able to, to tell those stories and, and connect the dots and have people tie in and take advantage of those amenities. Making the brand make its way into your wayfinding signage, creating comprehensive wayfinding systems, street banners. So you start to see that the community understands how all these different components fit together. And then we also start to illustrate the difference between where your organization brand needs to be versus where your destination brand needs to be. Your Main Street organization identity, if you have the appropriate tools in your toolbox, probably doesn't need to be on a street banner. That's not really the, the kind of thing that you're promoting in that space. So it just gets you thinking about the right tools and how to use those. Now with that, I'm gonna continue to go through and, and share with you different examples and uh, case studies and kind of what to take away from those. But I just wanna remind you all, if you do have questions, uh, feel free to, to put those in the chat box or in the, the question box. I'm more than happy to, to hit on those. And another kind of interesting note, um, we've gone through and we've looked at Opelousas and we've looked at Elkins already. Um, both of those systems were created in three days on the ground with an immersive process with a team of two people. So this thought that a branding process has to be a year long and tens of thousands of dollars, it's just not the case. Um, these do not have to, to bankrupt your organization. Um, in fact, it really makes sense for efficiency to be part of this because for you to implement it, it has to be usable. It has to be adaptable and expandable. And we believe that by compressing it into a timeline like that, we kind of stress the, the, the toolbox. If 
we can't create the deliverables that we expect to be able to, to give you, then there must be something about the system that makes it too hard to use. So that's just a good thing to kind of take away and file away in your head. Now from here, I wanna share a little bit about Grayling, Michigan. Grayling is a community of 1800, so not very big at all. Um, they are the starting place of what they call the canoe marathon. It's a hundred mile canoe race from Grayling, Michigan to Oscoda, Michigan. And the idea of canoes and, and paddling and the river were huge to them. That was one of the big things for their community. Now, in addition to that, uh, Grayling is the name of a fish and they were named after that fish. So any way that they could connect the river, canoeing, paddling, and the fish was what they were going for. This was the logo that they had been using, and it was affectionately known as Daffy Duck in a Canoe. And if you look and you kind of see those, those feathers that were intended to be from a, a native uh, in a canoe, um, once you see the duck, you can't unsee the duck. So the city was very much um, on board for anything that might be different. But when we went to Grayling, we were working directly for the Grayling Main Street program. So in doing this, we looked at Main Street, we looked at their downtown, we looked at what would the CBB, who's promoting the whole community, say, and then what would the city say. So we created the overarching visitor destination brand, this stylized G, bringing in the, the grayling fish along the bottom with its unique dorsal fin, bringing in the canoe and the river, having this stylized version of the R with that sweeping R with the, the water below it, and then introducing this very simple phrase, naturally colorful. So this is that, that community-wide level and that CVB level. Now from there, the city itself, they wanted to adapt the Daffy Duck, but they liked the concept. So we simply gave them a stylized version of a person in a canoe with that kind of treescape behind it, which is unique to the, the Michigan North where they're located. Then with the downtown destination, we actually created a downtown logo variation with this tagline, Michigan's most colorful river town. So again, you start to see there's a direct tie between the overall community-wide marketing and the downtown variation. And again, creating little variants, we simplified down the swoop and the R, we created that stylized version of the paddle. And then again, created this stylized simple G with just the canoe. So it gives them a lot of different ways to highlight and succinctly communicate about this downtown district. And then the Main Street brand was simply this kind of array of boat paddles, again, bringing in those four colors of the four point approach. So you start to see how those come together into an overall system. You start to see that Grayling Main Street's the organization, downtown Grayling is the place they're promoting, the colors are the same, the typefaces are the same, but it gives that, you know, let's be honest. I mean, there are things that um, Main Street organizations do that sometimes frustrate the merchants. Uh, you can put on a festival and bring 15,000 people to their front door and they will say they don't get any customer and they're not their customer. So, you know, this separation between the organization identity and the destination that you promote is important. Those businesses should always see the value in promoting the place, even if they might be frustrated with the organization. Grayling has an amazing collection of events. This is one of the things that I'll, I will always take away. They created this just fantastic uh, selection of events. One of the cool things that they do is called Paddle Battle. They actually build a pool, an above ground pool on their main street and put a canoe in it 
and put two people facing each other and essentially it's a tug of war against each other in the same uh, canoe and they do it in march leading up to the canoe marathon and they actually have a bracket of 64 participants much like march madness so great event there you can see even with things like the christmas walk how we we brought in the canoe paddles into the snowflake and uh, they even launched a new program where they created these little miniature golf holes that could be moved all throughout their downtown. And um, they did a, a putt-putt tournament, but you had to use a, a boat paddle instead of a putter. So you can see all those different things kind of reinforcing that brand identity. Now with that, we jump over to Troutdale, Oregon. Troutdale is a fantastic community just on the outskirts of Portland. So again, remember that step one, look at what you have. Um, this was their current city logo. Uh, of course, they're called Troutdale. Strangely enough, they were more known for the small feeder fish called smelt, but obviously they were um, very much, they, they are directly on a trout stream. This logo is actually derived from an illustration of a sculpture of these two jumping trout in their downtown. So um, they had this kind of interesting presence uh, of the, the art and the, the sculpture, but then they also had this old seal that kind of had the rail line running next to the river with the bluff in the background and the rising sun facing east, and then this whole uh, idea of gateway to the Columbia River Gorge. They've used that phrase, gateway to the gorge for a hundred years. So how do you manage all of those things? And the city, the organization, the city was our client, but they were also creating a new Main Street organization and they needed help naming it. So make sense of the colors. Um, this is one of the more complex color systems, but what we actually did was we identified a color palette that was kind of a broad range of very natural colors that go from a, a rich blue. We included kind of a copper patina color that was the color that a metal trestle bridge in their downtown was painted, and then just a variety of greens and browns. Very, very natural base is their primary base. Then they also had some neutrals in their grays and their kind of warm whites. Um, but then we did something a little interesting there where we also brought in a light blue and a light pink that was directly sampled out of a rainbow trout from their, their stream. So those colors were kind of hard to use at times, so we wanted to identify those as accents, and you'll see how that all kind of comes together. Step three, create consistency in the name. So again, we identified typefaces for them. This is the first community that we ever identified a single typeface for all of the arts organizations and arts initiatives. So the script typeface at the bottom was literally identified as the arts typeface. And believe it or not, if you've ever tried to work with multiple groups of artists, you will find that that's not always the easiest task. It was amazing this gesture of kind of identifying a typeface for the arts community motivated them to tie in visually, and it really went a long way. So with all that, you can kind of see this is what that word type looks like. We want Troutdale to be communicated consistently, and this is what that looks like. So then from there, you know, in the last example, we said embrace the awkward. Well, everybody's not going to have the awkward, and you don't need to feel compelled to go through and find some sort of unique thing that nobody else can say. A lot of branding consultants will say that is the key. Find something nobody else can say. I disagree with that completely. I think that as a place, especially as an organization that is the steward of a downtown, you actually need to find things that make people comfortable and lean into that comfort. So there, what we did was we we leaned into these ideas of the water 
and how they were shaped by the water, the Columbia Gorge. This kind of idea of being rooted, rooted in their history and surrounded by these amazing forests. Transported and connected to the historic Columbia River Highway, where you can literally still see these stones of this early 1900s transportation infrastructure run through their downtown. Connected and this amazing picturesque bridge right over the water in their downtown. And then grounded with this amazing bluff that overlooks their downtown. So these ideas and these concepts and these values that all kind of tied in together and created this very, very simple kind of message of, of historic Troutdale, our nature will move you. Now with this, you start to see how the pieces kind of tie in together. Um, just because we have a tagline doesn't mean that we do away with this 100-year-old gateway to the gorge. Sometimes you simply formalize that. Uh, that's called a moniker. And it can stick around and, and it can live forever. But that frees you up to have a tagline that is a little bit more adaptable to market forces. Then you start to see how some of the art can mature. Um, again, simplified down systems, one color versions, showing how it layers on top of original art. But then you want to expand the system. So again, how that works for the city. This is a breakdown of their city government with their four major departments and all the sub departments and divisions. Um, again, using color to help understand how all that works even doing things like email signatures for your organization. Now I said that they wanted to create a main street there. Um, it was a unique community because they did not actually have a historic downtown. Their downtown was constructed in the past 30 years. Um, they have a major redevelopment site that I'm gonna talk more about in just a second. So what we did is we recommended that it be known as the Town Center Alliance. And in that town center alliance, you kind of see these colors coming together and converging. Some people kind of see water, some people see a fish. It, it was stylistic on purpose, but clearly marking that as an Oregon Main Street program. And then the connecting the dots, you know, I talked about this major development site. If you look at this image at the bottom of the image, you will see that. 1980s and 90s downtown strip. Um, it's separated by a railroad track and also a significant topographic change. And then you see the outlined major redevelopment site that was a former tannery site. And to the left of that, you see a gigantic outlet mall. So as you can imagine, uh, very complicated dynamics to transition um, down, you know, these two spots are disconnected. And honestly, uh, when we went in, everyone was calling this site the urban revitalization site. And I kind of said, wow, you have literally found the least sexy way to talk about a riverfront downtown development site in the Portland Metro. So what we did is we drafted this kind of brand statement for the site, um, exciting them about it. Uh, the time is now, the opportunity is here, the vision is bold. And then we launched this whole brand, the Confluence at Troutdale, really kind of being able to give them a more sophisticated way to talk about that redevelopment site. We branded the arts, we talked about that already, showed them how minimal effort and redesign in some of the pre-existing logos and adopting colors, um, showing this consistency in the brand evolution, things like cruise-ins, um, and even trying to take this whole idea of 
right now it's just called Troutdale Cruise Inn, but what if you called it Fins on the Sandy, which is the name of the, the river that runs right through there. So, you know, starting to think funny ways or clever ways that you can tie a community named after a fish into events like this. Um, the Arts in Action, these were the four major initiatives. They were doing what they called Art Trout, which they were just doing different artistic representations of trout throughout. Uh, they're the home of a globally known uh, public art sculptor. So we really promoted this idea of having a public art master plan where you go through and you map out where the art installations go and how they will shape or impact the community. A sculptural signs program so that they could use the art to actually enhance the quality of business signage in the community. And then also a vibrancy program simply called Vibrant Troutdale that were micro grants to add color and life to the community. Smelt Belt was the name of a bike trail coming through the community, showing how the brand can make its way to merchandise, that wayfinding signage, and then our marketing message. And what we actually did there was we even created a expandable system of ad headlines so that they could kind of go through the first we called the cadence series, our nature will move you, our sculpture will inspire you. So it mimics the cadence of their tagline. And then the second is the value series, rooted in history, shaped by water. So again, showing those values that we identified leading into the process. And then finally, step eight, create the chorus. It is so very important to help implement and then launch that brand. So this is a very simple, comprehensive checklist broken down into three phases. There is no magic order. Every community is different, but this gets all the things that you need to think about from an organizational brand rollout all onto one page. And then from there, we also like to create a how to be a brand partner page. This is a great way to share with other organizations, other business owners or event organizers, how they might be able to take advantage and echo the messages of the brand. And then finally, we also like to give a brand score sheet so that the organization can self score their own implementation and begin to better identify the low hanging fruit and identify what their next steps might be. So with that, I am at the conclusion of the major case studies and I was able to keep it more or less on time. I wanted to preserve 15 minutes or so at the end. I have more that I can share, but I wanna make sure that I have an opportunity to engage in any questions and, and see if I can help any, any you know, answer any questions that anybody might have. So if you do have any questions, feel free to kind of jump in on those. And uh, if I don't see any come in, then I will jump right through the speed round and I'll continue to share some of my, my favorite quick examples. And then we will uh, wrap this up and, and wrap up the first session of the virtual conference. So, so I am not seeing anything come in quite yet, and I will keep my eyes on the chat and the question function, but let me just run through and, and I will share with you a couple of my favorites. Uh, this first one comes from Hollister, California. If you've ever heard of Hollister, you might have seen it in a local shopping mall. Hollister, California is a brand that is owned by the Abercrombie & Fitch Company. Uh, this is the first community that I ever worked in that was sued by a major American corporation for making t-shirts with their own community's name on it. So there we were actually working for their Main Street organization. Um, we identified the color palette directly derived from the produce that their community grew. One of the things that was interesting, if you know Hollister California as a brand, you know that it is the typical California surf shop. The actual Hollister California is an agrarian community. Their high school mascot is the hay baler. So we wanted to make sure that every decision we made reinforced this idea that amazing things grow here. So with the overall community identity, we kind of got a little snarky. Hollister, the original, kind of pointing out that, hey, we're a little different than maybe you think you know. 
with their downtown, the opposite of a mall. So we kind of leaned into what people thought they knew about Hollister. Um, and then we launched this whole campaign at the San Francisco market as a weekend excursion campaign. And it was called the perfect place to bail. Again, playing off of the hay baler and positioning them as a really, really approachable escape to that metro market. We did typical ads like you might imagine, showing off the vintners and the wine uh, producers, but we also launched the original Hollister model campaign. If you know anything about Abercrombie and Fitch, they're known for their black and white ads of uh, topless men. So we played up and, and kind of showed off the farmers and vintners and, and even the bikers. Uh, Hollister is known to be the birthplace of the American biker and uh, the inspiration for the movie Easy Rider. So being able to kind of show that and tell that story was important as well. From there, we jumped to Buford, South Carolina. Buford is this kind of beautiful historic community right along the South Carolina coast, nestled between Charleston and Savannah. Um, all their events, they do these amazing events. None of them were really tied together. Uh, they do win points for having both a jogging shrimp and a saxophone playing crab. Um, they're also about four hours from, spelled the same, but Beaufort, North Carolina. So it was amazing to hear how many times people meant to go to one state and ended up in another. So what we did with them is we landed on this very interesting idea of what we call a position statement. Established before Savannah, discovered before Charleston. We wanted to make sure that they were very clear of their level of prominence in this corridor of history that brings visitors in. Now, we had this kind of tagline of historic retreat. One of the things that is interesting about Beaufort is as, um, as the Civil War was raging, they heard that that the Union forces were coming and as they would always say, they buried the silver and ran. So uh, the Union forces came on to a completely vacant town and they decided to keep the, you know, to keep the buildings, preserve the buildings. And that is why the story is so very much um, intact today. So we went through again, branding the, the events, tying all those together through color and typeface. But one of the things I love about the community was some of the, the ads. By the time Savannah was founded, we were already old enough to drink. So kind of, again, confidently playing their, their story. A, a lot of Forrest Gump was filmed here and um, they have a home, uh, they've got a business called the Chocolate Tree. Tom Hanks fell in love with the Chocolate Tree. So literally as he is sitting in that historic square in Savannah filming the life is a box of chocolate scene for Forrest Gump, he was eating chocolates out of a chocolate tree box. Uh, so being able to tell those stories is so very important for community pride. Then we jump over to Virginia. In Virginia, they have this funny a little dynamic where they pronounce names wrong to figure out whether you're a Yankee or not. So to everyone else, this would be Buena Vista. In Virginia, it's Buena Vista. And Buena Vista was a mid 1800s master planned industrial community. So even their name, Buena Vista, just means good view. It doesn't mean great view, doesn't mean amazing view. It's just, it's good view. And we kind of introduced this idea of, of good views reveal great vision. But one of the things that was so interesting about Buena Vista was this sign. Welcome to Buena Vista, 6,002 happy citizens and three old grouches. And this sign has been around since 1971. If you Google the word grouch, this sign will come up on the first page of results. So we decided to take those three old grouches and turn them into the ambassadors of the community. We started to tell the stories of all the things that the community had to offer. And we started to really play up the idea of the three old grouches. And one of my favorite things that they did was they actually, every year, they would nominate three people to be the old grouches for the Christmas parade and they would mic them up and they would criticize every float that came by. So they really owned that kind of funny dynamic that was all derived from this hand painted sign. And imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. So we have Fort Laramie here, five, 250 good people and six sore heads. 
And then my final example this morning, and one of my favorites is comes from Traveler's Rest, South Carolina. Um, Traveler's Rest was one of those communities when we originally worked with them that it truly was a pass through community. It was a place that you drove through to access seven different state parks. It was the place where the Blue Ridge Mountains truly began. And um, the other thing that you have to know is in this part of, of South Carolina, uh, nobody called it Traveler's Rest. Everybody called it TR. And I grew up about 10 minutes from there and, and I kind of told them, I was like, I'm not sure that we have enough money to make people stop calling it TR. But what we can do is turn TR into a good thing. So how do you brand a community that people call TR and is the gateway to the outdoors without being a gateway? Well, we wanted to make them a base camp. And I came up with this phrase, get in your element, which then led to the inspiration for the logo that was derived from the periodic table. So we simply have this simple TR. And then we launched this campaign with it starts with TR. And we featured words like tradition, tranquil, travel, trails, trip, trek, trees transported, and even trapped. And what this really shows us is it shows us that the ideas don't always have to be big. They don't always have to be complex. In fact, some of the most effective are the ones that are the simplest. When we presented this, one of the magical things that we witnessed was, of course, as we were presenting it, we had a local Ford dealer in the audience that said, trucks start with TR, which everybody laughed, but after the meeting, all these little clusters of local business owners had gathered together and were talking about what their TR could be. This magic point, because of the simplicity and the obvious path to inclusion, the brand was now being launched by the public sector and private sector in concert, simply by inspiring them and showing them how they can participate. So, with that, I wanna bring this morning's uh, presentation to a close. Again, if there is any last minute question, um, I, I'm hoping that no questions simply mean that I, I did a, a good enough job explaining it to you all. Um, but again, I wanna to echo the, uh, the thanks to Joyce and, and Francis Joe for the invitation to be a part of this and, and especially to be the, the first presentation to kick off this virtual conference. and. Again, thank you to Kevin and Jonathan for the, the introduction and your leadership and guidance um, for Heritage. Uh, ben, we do have some some questions that have come in that maybe you haven't seen on your panel, okay. but the first one is, thank you for the presentation. Will you please reiterate the importance of differentiating the organization brand versus the destination brand and why this is so important? Absolutely. So you have a multitude of organizations each one needs to have their own identity, but those organizations need to be sharing a shared community brand. Um, every organization is different. It's motivated off of uh, different means and, and it has different target audiences. Uh, Chambers of Commerce, for example, are oftentimes membership based and therefore they, they have to have a certain focus on ROI for the members where oftentimes Main Street organizations are directly serving a geographic district. But the thing that they are all doing is they are trying to make and, and build that brand equity in the place. And if you subdivide and, and confuse the issue and only use your organization identity to promote the place, you're essentially holding the full potential of the community hostage. You're trying to co-op the potential of the community into viability for the organization. So, so trying to create that shared platform for the destination brand and then preserving the individuality of the organizations that are telling that community story. Okay, this is a very similar question, and I don't know if you want to rephrase the answer to make sure the point is across. Our city, Chamber, and Main Street have three different logos. How should we address this issue? 
So the big thing that I would do if you had three organizations who were willing to sit down at the table, uh, explore your colors, explore your typefaces, and see if there's some way without a major change that you can actually just visually adopt some continuity without the goal being to try to force everyone to look exactly alike. So go back to the four components of the brand toolbox, see if there are any low commitment modifications that you could make that would allow everyone to see that you're trying to start working together. Okay, Dan has a question. Can you please review your five no rules? I believe I missed one. Okay, so the five no rules, the first is the khaki rule, uh, say no to design by committee. The second is the uh, say no to design contests. The third is a community seal is not a marketing tool. The fourth is the screwdriver rule. You have to have the right tool for the right job. That is the dis difference between the destination brand and the organization brands. And then the fifth is the um, the gateway rule. It's the own your own brand. So don't give your identity away to a larger regional entity just because it might be attractive. Okay, we don't have any more questions. We will be putting uh, Ben's presentation in our resources. And thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I, I always really enjoy Ben's presentations. I've seen you a couple of times and I, I really appreciate how engaging you are and, um, and how definitely different every brand is that you create. So thank you so much for sharing with us. For those of us, for those of you who are here during the live session, thanks so much for tuning in. Um, thanks for pivoting with us this morning away from Zoom and uh, back to GoToWebinar. Um, if you are signed up for our afternoon session, watch your email uh, to see if there's still a change. We're really not sure if Zoom has uh, been uh, relaunched or if we're gonna have to switch everything to go to webinar so just be sure to keep watching your inbox for that same link that you received for this session um, so our next presentation will be this afternoon the myth of the retail apocalypse with kathleen norris and sharon woods at 2 p.m um, i hope that all of you are joining us there and thanks again to ben enjoy the rest of your afternoon thanks so much have a great day guys thank you bye Thank you.